Um, so um, I wanted to talk about this issue because this is related to um, organic, but a different policy issue. We, um, you can certify a, a piece of land. No, I mean, sorry. You can take like an Amazon forest, cut it down, and get it certified tomorrow and ready to grow something for USDA label. Is that crazy? Um, uh, or any, anything that you could get away with. Uh, here in the States, it's harder to, to do something really egregious. But um, still, like say in Napa, Sonoma area, there's so many vineyards going in there. They cut down these beautiful oak woodlands for organic. Like, is that good? Um, so, uh, anyway, so we worked with the NOSB and got them to uh, make a recommendation to the USDA to change that. And uh, they unanimously agreed. And um, so, uh, this, this is a presentation. I, I've made probably like 10 presentations to them over the years. But this was the final presentation I made to them. Um, vote yes to eliminate this, uh, fix this loophole. Um, there's 24 international organic and other eco-labels that don't allow conversion and then certification right after. Um, as you, I don't know if you guys have seen this, uh, study came out a few years ago, half of our wildlife populations are lost, which is sad really sad. Um, so what I did with this presentation too was I said, okay, we're going to stop conversion, but you can have some agriculture uh, using native ecosystems. Uh, we've seen that uh, grazing native ecosystems can be beneficial for some uh, rare species and, and um, for oak regeneration, all kinds of things. Uh, you can still harvest uh, maple syrup in uh, uh, native ecosystems. Um, and some people were concerned, what about, uh, you know, something has grown back. Like on the East Coast, a lot of the forests were cut down hundreds of years ago. And now, and it's crummy farmland. They cut it down for farmland. But it's rocky and hilly, and there's so much easier places to farm. It's grown back, and sometimes it's grown back like that. And so people were like, is that an native ecosystem? So we're just trying to explain to them that, that no, that isn't. Um, and that there is uh, lots of different ways that we could track this. And that's what we're working on now, verification tools. Um, so uh, palm oil, if you buy an organic product, sometimes it has palm oil in it. And right now, they can be cutting down forests that our orangutans are um, using. So I put this in at the very last. Are you for or against biodiversity? <laughs> and then the board was like asking me all these questions. And then later, when it was time to vote on it, they were asking me more questions. And well, can we switch this or that? And um, and I called up the NatureServe guy who we're working with. NatureServe is part of Nature Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy. And um, I guess it's on a timer. Um, uh, anyways, so uh, yes, they, they, they uh, made that recommendation. But one of the people came up to me later, and she said, um, how dare you ask me if I'm for or against biodiversity? Like that, you know, like take sides. I mean, you know, so, and I knew that was going to piss some people off. But I felt like, you know, we just have to put, uh, put the truth out there sometimes. So, um, yeah, so that's that. And that's not, so we're waiting for the administration to change. And then I think we're going to get that. You know, ideally, the administration it used to be years and years and years ago, Republicans cared about conservation, too. Maybe we'll get back to that someday. Um, uh, so anyways, um, 
I was going to talk about food safety and conservation because um, what happened back in 2006 with the spinach contamination where um, uh, three to five people died, depending on if you talk to the government or the attorneys, um, uh, it changed the face of how big ag looks at, at uh, wildlife on farms. And especially salad mix uh, growers. Um, and so uh, what happened was there was a knee-jerk reaction. Oh my God, we have to keep everything out, all habitat, all wildlife. And um, we worked with not with the organic community, only some of them, but a lot of. There's a really cool group called um, National Sustainable Ag Coalition based in D.C. They've been in D.C. forever. If you really care about sustainable ag policy, you should check them out and go work for them or, yeah, see what they're up to. But why they're so valuable is because there's sustainable ag groups all across the country now, and they're members of INSAC. And so when INSAC has an a, a issue that they really care about, then they uh, work closely with Congress to educate them, and uh, then they also go out to all their members and get their members to tell Congress what to do. So it's cool. It's really uh, an awesome uh, organization. And so we worked with them, and we were the conservation piece. And uh, you know, at first people were like, "Well, you know, that's so low on the list," because mostly the smaller we typically work with small and mid-sized growers and they're like, this is going to be really easy for industrial size ag. They just hire somebody else to do food safety um, uh, requirements, as in, you have to keep this whole set of records now because of uh, FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act. But, you know, a small grower who's doing, has all these different hats, it's hard. And, um, but anyways, they got it, they got it that yes, we need pollinators, so that means we need pollinator habitat, but we need habitat for all these different reasons. And what this is about is how habitat windbreaks filter uh, uh, wind, windborne pathogens, like on dust, wetlands filter uh, waterborne pathogens, and so do filter strips, um, uh, more of the same, more of the same, uh, this is a cool slide. Um, the more diversity you have in the soil, the more um, that the diverse microorganisms compete with, consume, and um, antagonize pathogens, uh, foodborne pathogens that are harmful to us because those would rather be in our gut than in the soil predominantly. And so, what do you know? It's like. Uh, conservation, farming with nature, is really actually good for us. It's good for food safety, it's good for lots of different things. The sun, um, uh, UV radiation kills pathogens and desiccates them. Um, and uh, there's regulations for, um, I'm just going to skip some of this. Um, sorry. Sometimes food safety auditors say, you have to have a big border like this, a, a dirt border between uh, habitat and your crops. But other times, uh, food safety auditors say, you got to get rid of that habitat or we're not buying the first 40 feet of your crop. And uh, that's a problem, especially in uh, our area where, that, where it's very costly to grow crops. Um, and it all came from... This all started with the spinach contamination. If you could imagine, you know when you mow a lawn, or if you've ever seen somebody mow a lawn, you look at the back end, or the tilt it up, and then you see the bottom is all slimy. Well, when they harvest a uh, salad mix, they come in these huge tractors, and it's this huge mower. And if you look at the whole thing is slimy. So, I mean, as in, Maybe it's not, I mean, we would all be dead by now if it really made us sick, but it's just, it's cutting all those leaf surfaces, and if there's any contamination, it mixes it all together. Then they take that, they put it 
in a vat of water that's chlorinated and, and cooled to the right temperature, but sometimes it isn't cooled correctly or chlorinated correctly. And if there's any pathogen at all, it's going to spread to all of that. And then they put it in a bag and tell you you can put it in your, in your refrigerator for two weeks. Uh, it's not the greatest, safest product. And so they, this industrial ag has come along and said, oh, well, let's get rid of habitat so we can farm the way we want to farm. And really, we should be farming. Um, uh, you, I mean, it, it, for me, I will buy a bag of salad mix from somebody at the farmer's market. I trust that a lot more. Um, but, and or I just buy a head of lettuce because every head of lettuce is hand harvested. They look at it. They're not going to give you something that has poop all over it, for instance. Uh, and they don't wash those in a vat. Yes. So, uh, so when I buy like Spanish, it says like triple washed. Is it still safe, or should I just wash it again? You can't wash pathogens off. So when they say that, they, it's really marketing. Um, it's either pathogens are either there or they're not there. Um, our board early on said we're not going to fight the uh, bagged lettuce, salad mix, spinach folks because we'd never win. Because, you know, I mean, they go to Bahamas every chance they get. They're state disturbed. They're billionaires. And, um, uh, but uh, I don't think it's that safe of a product. I know a lot of you probably buy it because it's easy, and that's why the American public buys it. It's, you know, we're all too busy and trying to eat well. Uh, but just buying a head of lettuce or a bunch of spinach is safer. So, um, so anyways, we were successful with educating Congress and FDA that, that uh, hedgerows and grass waterways and wetlands and uh, having a diverse soil microbiology is safe, makes food safer. And so they, when they wrote their regulations, they did not say, uh, you've got to get rid of all wildlife. So that was great. And, um, but now some of the otters don't believe it. And that was a problem. Push really hard to get government to make the auditors back off, but they're like, we can't tell industry what to do. Yes. So, um, what does it take to be an auditor? Like, do they have to have an education, like the background education, for them to even care to be an auditor, or is it just something that anyone, DMV people, could just go and be an auditor? Well, you have. Uh, that's a really good question, and there's no cert certificate. There's no. Uh, um, bar that you have to meet. Um, you can work for the state of California, and I bet you they look at your education somewhat, but I, I'm, I know nobody's got a master's. Uh, I mean, they're not hiring at that level. They might have a master's, but um, uh, sometimes the people that come out there are used to audit, auditing um, uh, other like in, in, in closed buildings and they're, they they don't want to get dirty you know it's a it's a problem uh, and we actually at one point tried to educate auditors but um, yeah it was a big uh, we had we created materials for them and uh, I think we moved the needle a little bit but not a lot um, so um, and then there's a lot of private auditors and uh, um, yeah, I don't think that they have, there's any um, baseline of what they have to know. Um, so, so. so just to expand on that a little bit, the, um, you all would be welcome in a lot of companies. They don't tend to have a really highly qualified applicant pool and they usually rely on training them with whatever their standards are internally, mm -hmm. which is why it can be so okay. inconsistent. Yeah. So if you all want to go into this field, it would be good. Yeah, it would be good because maybe, maybe you could understand that, uh, you know, with your environmental training that there's, you know, it's not simple. It's not like, you know, dirt, ooh, keep it away from us. But because, you know, it keeps us healthy, actually. There's studies that 
so diversity keeps us healthy. Um, so uh, I was going to switch gears and talk about um, this publication and birds, because this is where my passion is right now, and um, so fun. Um, so <coughs> birds, when they feed their uh, nestlings, they need that high protein, and predominantly they're eating uh, insects. There's most, uh, there's a few birds that are like they only eat fruit or they only eat grains. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and I should say, and then there's the carnivores, right, that are eating meat, but uh, for songbirds. Um, and so if, if that's the case, you know, we hear, like I used to talk to farmers about birds and they would be like, they didn't want to hear how beneficial they were. They wanted to go straight to the fact that some birds made them lose some money. But now that we've published this document, um, that doesn't happen so much anymore. I wanted to... Um, This is the appendix of that document, but there's about uh, almost 120 studies uh, that about avian pest control, and 90% of them show that there's a benefit. There are a few studies that um, show that there wasn't any benefit, and there was, I think, one or two show there was a problem. And when there was a problem, i.e., the birds, uh, this this is when we're looking at our birds uh, eating. Uh, the, the, the problem, the pest. Um, and when we, the two that were uh, not showing that, they were eating the beneficial insects. Oops. So that happens, right? It's nature. Um, but uh, so over time, in fact, uh, this is from the 1920s, but actually back in the 1880s, um, when the USDA was just getting formed, um, uh, people were realizing that birds were getting decimated. Women were wearing too many feathers on their hat, or half a bird on their hat, um, and and just indiscriminately killing and eating them. And um, and anyway, so uh, but a lot of people were like, "Wait a second, birds are helping us on the farm." And so way back in that, so they created this. Uh, the vision of economic ornithology back then. And then 40 years later, <coughs> in the 20s, um, they were looking at uh, bird stomachs. Um, during that whole time, they would, they would told farmers, or a lot, yeah, I think it was most of that time, they would ask farmers to shoot the birds and uh, mail in their stomachs and gizzards and pickle them at first in alcohol or whatever. And, um, and then the scientists would see what are the birds eating. And so that was really um, basic kind of, I mean, it was cool, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough. It was like, well, what crop was that from? And, you know, where in the landscape? And what was around it? And how, you know, did it help with yields? And um, since then, though, um, there's been other kinds of research. What I did when I looked at, um, when I went to school here, I studied birds eating codling moth in apple orchards, and um, I had this exclusion where I had codling moth that I put out in the winter on trees, and the codling moth is a moth, it's a caterpillar, it spins a cocoon on the tree bark, and, um, and then I wouldn't let birds get to half of them, and the other half I just put out there where birds could eat them, and I found that um, in some of the uh, orchards, 70%, but up to 90% of the calling moth in the winter would be eaten by birds. And um, so that's an exclusion um, kind of study. Um, these days, um, more and more people are looking at benefits to the crop, which I didn't do. Um, uh, they're do using modeling studies, which are kind of like estimates. Uh, you could guess what is going to happen based on all this other knowledge you have. 
Um, they're using DNA analysis, like t um, there's a study um, where, um, I have so many slides, this is why I'm just scrolling through, um, anyways, am I going to find this, um, where swallows are flying over rapeseed crop, rape is like, a, it's kind of a brassica, kind of a, like broccoli crop only is the seed that they grow for oil and um, the swallows ate 20% 20 20 of their diet was the pests of that crop and they found that by looking at the DNA of the, um, the feces that were dropped uh, under the swallow nest because um, some birds it's easy to collect their feces and, and swallows are one of them. And, um, I wanted to tell you, you probably have already heard this recently, that um, birds are in decline. Uh, this came out of three weeks ago, maybe a month ago. This study in science that um, three billion birds in North America are uh, gone now and uh, since the 1970s and some of them are doing worse than others. If you look to the left of this, um, right here on this, on this side, these are all the declining kinds of uh, birds. Grassland birds are doing the poorest. Um, but what's interesting about this is wetland birds are doing good. And, and the reason why is because we, I don't know, like in the 80s, 70s and 80s, realized that we've taken out all these wetlands and um, uh, our wetland and shore birds are, was, were really declining. And so conservationists got together with hunters and they now conserve a lot of those wetlands. And yes, they hunt some of those birds, but overall the birds are increasing. So, I mean, when you look at that and um, think about how agriculture can support birds and help to turn things around too, um, it's, you know, it's hopeful. Um, but I think this decline is related to the insect decline that we've been hearing about too. Um, there's just another study out a couple of days ago about it, and it was related, this was a German study, the first, I think, one of the most important insect studies came out of Germany because they had these citizen scientists track what insects were doing for 40 or 50 years, and um, basically they could see this decline really steep. And um, so now they've taken that data and looked at how is it related to agriculture? And, uh, and, and so a study the other day said, came out and said, yes, it is, especially in the larger landscape. When there's agriculture nearby, even uh, a native ecosystem, there's going to be less insects because of the ag. And um, I think it's, it's a, a few things uh, with agriculture. It takes, agriculture takes more habitat. Agriculture is spraying pesticides, and we are using these neonics. This is not like everybody agrees with this. Um, I don't think uh, Monsanto and Dow agree with this statement, but um, uh, neonicotine uh, pesticides are um, harmful to birds and 